All right, so we are going to talk about chapter one, sections one and two. Section one is what is science, and section two is using a scientific approach. You can follow along in the book if you'd like, uh, or you can just watch the video. Here are some important vocabulary. So if you have a really hard time um, remembering vocab and there are some words here that you don't know, I recommend pausing the video right now and looking up some of these words because it will help you um, further along in the video and as we learn more things to really understand some of these terms. Now, science, what is it? Science is a system of knowledge and the methods you use to find that knowledge. So the methods that we use to find that scientific knowledge are things like observing and measuring. Um, science always begins with curiosity and that curiosity leads to questions and those questions lead to um, making observations and measuring things and trying to come up with an answer. And this curiosity often ends with discovery. Now, when we discover something new, it usually lends itself to toward advancing technology. So technology is the use of knowledge to solve practical problems. And science allows us to uncover, uncover this knowledge. And science and technology are interdependent. You can't have one without the other. You can see in these pictures, really, really old computers took up an entire room at one point. And now we have computers that are really small. They're in your, your cell phones and they're much, much, much more powerful. And that technology has advanced because of the advances in science. Now, there are three branches of natural science. There are physical sciences, earth and space science, and life science. So physical science is what we're, we're going to be studying this year, which is physics and chemistry. And physics kind of encompasses a little bit of everything. So we will talk about a little bit of earth and space science as well. Now, physical science itself can be broken down into four main topics. There's space and time, matter and change, forces and motion, and energy. And in my mind, energy is kind of all encompassing of the other three. Energy is a huge topic in physical science and the universe and the way that it, it grows and the way that it exists as we know it is really depends on how much energy and what kinds of energy we have. Now, when we talk about curiosity leading to discovery, there has to be some kind of pathway to get from the curiosity and the question that leads from that to a new discovery. And that pathway is called the scientific method. So an organized plan for gathering, organizing, and communicating information is called the scientific method. And the goal of any scientific method is to solve a problem or to better understand an observed event. So this is where curiosity comes in. Like you ask a question, hmm, I wonder why? You use the scientific method to gather some data and analyze it and try and come to some result. Now in this class, this is what our scientific method is going to look like. So way up here at the top, even before anything I have written down is curiosity, right? You'll make an observation. Hmm, I see that the rainbow has many colors in it. Then you ask a question. I wonder why that is. And then you develop a hypothesis. I think it's because rainbows are made by unicorns. Then you would test your hypothesis with an experiment. I think I'm going to go find a rainbow and look for a unicorn. And then you would analyze your data and draw your conclusions. I didn't find any unicorns when I was looking at my rainbow, so my guess is my hypothesis is not supported. Now, if your hypothesis is not supported, you have to go back to your original hypothesis and revise it, change it. Now, if I did find a unicorn, my hypothesis would be supported. And that doesn't mean I'm done. That means I have to go back to my original hypothesis and come up with more experiments so that I can take more data and make sure my hypothesis is supported in every case. Now, after a, hip a hypothesis has been put through many, 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 many tests and it holds up, that's when that hypothesis um, can be put to developing a theory. 
Now, as we go through all of these, there are some specific terms we need to know. The first term is manipulated variable. A manipulated variable is the thing that you change when you have a controlled experiment. So let's say you want to do an experiment to see if the color of your hair changes the way that the cute boy in the cafeteria looks at you. The hair color changing would be the manipulated variable. That's the thing you have control over and what you want to change. Now the responding variable is what changes or does not change based on the thing that you had control over. So in our scenario, the responding variable would be the cute boy. When you change your hair, does he react differently or does he react exactly the same? Now, this is what we call a controlled experiment because in this experiment you are changing one thing and one thing only. That's hair color. If you were to change your hair color and your outfit at the same time, that would no longer be a controlled experiment because then you would have more than one manipulated variable, more than one thing you changed. All of these things are very important when we analyze data and draw conclusions. We need to know what we are looking at what we're measuring, what we are controlling, and we need to be able to say, when I change this, it changes this. All of this could eventually lead to a scientific theory. And a scientific theory is an attempt at explaining a pattern that you see. That pattern is what we call a scientific law. So, a scientific law describes an observed pattern in nature without attempting to explain it. The second you try to explain it, you're getting into a scientific theory. So, gravity pulls things toward the, the surface of the Earth. That would be a scientific law. That is a pattern that we can observe in nature. Saying gravity pulls things toward the surface of the Earth because there's a giant magnet there, would be working toward a scientific theory. That would be it trying to explain why it's happening. Now, if a pattern that we see for a scientific law is really difficult to understand, sometimes a scientific model may be used. And we're going to use a lot of scientific models in this class. Those include flow charts, like you saw earlier. They include data tables. They include graphs. They include pictures and schematics and all kinds of things. And scientific models can be very, very, very helpful when you're talking about patterns in nature. Now that is chapter one, section one and two. These are the image, the websites I got all my images from. And if you have any questions, please write them down and please finish the homework questions associated with these sections.